uh, Phil Drum. I'm the uh, president of the UNCG Atheists, Agnostics, and Skeptics. Uh, tonight we're proud to sponsor uh, Dr. Richard Carrier. Uh, he's a renowned author and speaker. Um, he holds a PhD from Columbia University in ancient history, specializing in the intellectual history of Greece and Rome, uh, particularly in the ancient philosophy, religion, and science, with an emphasis on the origins of Christianity and the uh, origins of science in the Roman Empire. Uh, he's best known as the author of Sense and Goodness Without God, Not the Impossible Faith, Why I'm Not a Christian, and a major contributor to the Empty Tomb, Christian Delusion, and the End of Christianity. Um, he's also the uh, editor-in-chief and now the editor emeritus of the Secular Web, and for his copious work in philosophy online and print. Uh, his latest book is Proving History, Faith Theorem, and the Quest for Historical Jesus. He's currently working on his next books, The Story of uh, Only Histori Historicity of Christ. Jesus Christ and the scientists in the Earth Roman Empire, as well as science education in the Earth Roman Empire. Um, uh, the uh, UNCG atheists and Gnostics and skeptics meet every week on Friday, uh, usually in EUC Phillips, but this week the meeting will be EUC Birch. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Richard here. All right. All right, let's see. Oh, good volume, it sounds like. Excellent. So let's begin. Why do I think Jesus didn't exist? Uh, the, so far, the only books I have that explicitly or come anywhere near to discussing this are these two, uh, Not the Impossible Faith and Proving History, which I have a few copies of today uh, if you're interested in learning more, and I'll, I'll reference them uh, several times in this talk. Uh, but the key book, that, which I finished, uh, so it's just now going through the peer review and production process uh, to become a published book, hopefully before the end of this year, will be on the historicity of Jesus Christ, which will basically take what I'm just going to summarize very briefly and just touch the tip of the iceberg on today. Uh, in that book, I, I detail every single aspect of this and discuss many of the objections and so on that come up. To begin the story, I have to explain uh, why I thought Jesus existed. Uh, why, for a long time, I thought this was a crackpot theory that Jesus didn't exist. The whole Jesus myth idea uh, I thought was nonsense, and I thought I could easily refute it. And often it was because people would send me uh, garbage arguments for it that I could easily refute. Uh, so I thought it was just another like uh, pyramid kind of scheme or something. Um, one of the reasons that I thought that uh, Jesus surely existed is that the argument from silence is much too weak. There are many uh, ancient people for whom we have no contemporary attest attestation. So the mere fact that we have a paucity of sources for Jesus in and of itself doesn't mean he didn't exist. Another is the idea that consensus should be trusted without a really good reason. If, if the consensus of scholarship is that Jesus existed, we should pretty much probably side with that unless we have a really good reason not to. Uh, and the arguments that I was receiving at the time uh, didn't give me a good enough reason to reject the consensus. Another point that I made was that there was no peer-reviewed case that had been made for it uh, through academic presses or through academic journals. It was mostly amateurs using bad methods, and it, it was easy to demonstrate that. And that made it look um, unbelievable to me. And another was uh, my assumption that there was no plausible explanation for why Christianity began or why a myth of historicity arose. Uh, usually the Jesus myth theories were built out of implausible conspiracy theories. Uh, they often had you know, elaborate you know, truther type tales as to how Christianity originated, which I found uh, intrinsically improbable. Until I read this book, uh, people convinced me that I should really look at this. This was the best case, they said, uh, for the Jesus myth theory that does the most serious scholarship and is the least amateur in its presentation. I found out that that was true. I wrote a review of this online that you can find uh, by Googling. Um, I found that the, it had mistakes. It wasn't uh, completely up to snuff in terms of an academic dissertation, but it was very close. Uh, and in fact, he does, Earl Doherty in the Jesus Puzzle does a pretty good job of making a sound case. I wasn't, con I wasn't convinced at this time, but I realized that there was a respectable case that could be made and it was worth investigating further. So what ultimately changed my mind uh, was that the argument from silence is still strong when you look at the epistles, not just the epistles of Paul, but a few others uh, that I'll talk about in this talk, um, that do look very strange if there was a historical Jesus, and I'll talk about that a little bit today. Another is that I discovered, and especially this most recently, that the consensus is based on fallacious methods and sometimes factually incorrect beliefs. I found that uh, a lot of historians who were defending historicity, uh, once you start asking them why they believe Jesus existed, the evidence and arguments that come from them uh, are very terrible, and in some cases as terrible as the arguments coming from mythicists. Uh, 
And also a peer reviewed case, I realized, could be made if we got rid of all the errors that proponents of this theory, the Jesus myth theory, were making. If we got rid of all the stuff they were doing wrong, what we had left over was still a case worth looking into. And finally, I realized, as Earl Doherty's book especially taught me, that there are plausible explanations for why Christianity began and why a myth of historicity arose. So we can actually explain Christianity with a Jesus myth theory, without any conspiracy theory nonsense. Now, the consensus issue, uh, I thoroughly demonstrate in the book Proving History, which I mentioned before. That was kind of part of the main point of that book, is when I, when I was asked to do this research and a bunch of fans got together to fund a grant for me to do this, this book on the historicity of Jesus Christ, the first task for any research project like this is to ask, well, how do we answer a question like this? How do we decide, how do we determine whether Jesus existed or not? What methodology should we use? So I immediately went to look at the methodologies that were being used already uh, and found that they're not only multiply fallacious and fallaciously applied, but that every single scholar who had published an analysis of the methods argued the same thing, that in fact there was unanimous agreement of all the scholars who had done uh, dedicated published analyses of these methods had all concluded that the methods were fallacious and being fallaciously applied. Uh, so I realized that the method was out. So I had to come up with a new method. Uh, my book talks about what that method is and also analyzes the old methods, the methods that are currently being used and why they're fallacious, citing all the scholars and scholarship who agree with me on that point. Uh, so once I realized that the consensus was ill-founded, now I had a good reason to doubt the consensus. Now we have to go back to the drawing board and look at the evidence all anew with a sound method and see what we get. Uh, and another thing about the plausible explanations, in fact, there are many respects in which Doherty's theory, for example, if we, if we strip down some of the excesses of it and get it to its bare minimum, it actually made better sense of a lot of the weird data about the origins of Christianity. Uh, in fact, I find that it makes better sense of a lot of things than any theory of historicity that has so far been proposed. A lot of the theories of a historical Jesus don't make as much sense of the data uh, as we have, as historicist proponents think it does. Now, if you want to learn more about this, the books to read is that book by Earl Doherty, The Jesus Puzzle. You can read my review for uh, the, the pros and cons of it. He did a sequel, uh, Jesus, Neither God Nor Man, which is kind of like a really extended appendix to the original book. That's also worth reading because he responds to a lot of critics there. Robert Price has a key book, The Christ Myth Theory and Its Problems, uh, where he really surveys the whole thing and also references some of his prior work that you might be interested in. Randall Helms does not argue for the non-existence of Jesus, but his short little volume, Gospel Fictions, uh, is a must read because it will disavow any thought that you have that the Gospels are reliable texts. And there's also an interesting uh, article by Stephen Laws, a philosopher. He published an article uh, in a philosophy journal called Evidence, Miracles, and the Existence of Jesus, which is available online. So you can Google it and read it. And he makes a very interesting case uh, for how we should doubt the historicity of Jesus, given the material in the Gospels. He doesn't treat the material in the epistles, which is a separate argument. And then, of course, really, there hasn't been a really good book uh, that, that I think is a thoroughly decisive or reliable book on the historicity of Jesus Christ, which is why I, I'm writing one. Uh, so that, that book will become the thing to go to and the thing to argue with if you still want to argue against the theory. Uh, for now, Proving History is stage one of this project. Uh, this is the first fruit of uh, the grant project that I've been working on. Uh, this talks all about method and uh, deconstructs and shows invalid a lot of the consensus assumptions about how we can prove the historicity of Jesus and eliminates a lot of claims about the historicity of Jesus. So let's begin with discussing what theory we're really talking about here. There's, there's really three different theories competing in the market of ideas right now. The first is the Christian notion of historicity, of course, which is that Jesus, as it says here, Jesus was an amazingly famous superman who could walk in water and fly and stuff. Uh, and their idea of the Gospels is the Gospels are the straight dope. They're totally eyewitness accounts and completely reliable. Uh, now, that's not the view of mainstream scholarship, of course. It's secular scholarship, mainstream scholarship, views historicity in a more uh, nuanced way. Their view is that Jesus was an ordinary nobody, kind of like a, a not a particularly famous Galilean preacher, whom no one noticed but a few fanatical followers, and that the Gospels they grant are mostly fiction, but there are kernels of truth in them that we can extract. But they do that using the methods that are invalid, which I talk about in Proving History. Now, the best theory of non-historicity, the best Jesus myth theory there is, reduces to this, uh, that Jesus was the name of a celestial being subordinate to God 
with whom some people hallucinated conversations or claimed to have hallucinated conversations, and that the gospel, the, go the written gospels that we have, began as a mythic allegory about this celestial Jesus set on earth as most myths then were. That wasn't unusual to do that. And so that's the basic theory. So this, these are the theories that we're testing against each other to see which one explains the evidence best or not. Now forget all the other mythicist theories. Uh, there's all these kinds of conspiracy theories and different kinds from different authors. Just throw them right out. They're, they're less defensible. Even if they're credible in any sense at all, they're less defensible than this basic theory that I've talked about here. Now I'm going to start with an analogy so you understand where I'm going with this. Uh, and if you think about the origin of Islam, uh, according to Islamic tradition, Muhammad quote-unquote, hallucinated, uh, conversations with the angel Gabriel, and the Quran records the spoken teachings of Gabriel. Uh, that's the basic principle of it. Mormonism, Joseph Smith, quote-unquote, hallucinated, conversations with the angel Moroni, and seeing words on magical plates, and the Book of Mormon records what the latter two said. Uh, I put hallucinates in quotes because hallucinate would be uh, what we would say if they were telling the truth, uh, but they may have been lying, uh, so it's a possibility. But either way, they're pretending to have visions and not actually meeting a, what we would call a normal earthly historical person. They're having visions of celestial beings and communicating their teachings that way. So the analogy holds here that Jesus was also originally a celestial being just like Gabriel and Moroni and taught his followers originally in the same way. Uh, whether they were lying about it or whether they were really genuinely having hallucinations is a separate question uh, that we don't need to answer. And then he was what we call euhemerized. Uh, this is the basic principle of stories being created uh, that placed him on earth interacting with historical figures. And the euhemerization is named after a Greek author by the name of Euhemerus before Christian times, uh, who actually historicized um, Zeus, for example, and Uranus, these gods. He claimed that they are originally kings in this, this lost distant kingdom uh, and that they were deified in later ages. And so this became a trend, and it was named after him, to euhemerize celestial deities, take them, put them in, pick a historical period, put them in there, write histories about them that fit them into the historical period as if they were ordinary men that walked the earth as demigods and were later deified. Uh, but in reality, they started as celestial beings. They didn't have earthly myths in the beginning. Uh, and so this, there were a lot of gods that this happened to. And then, of course, in the, according to the Christian theory, or the theory of Doherty, for example, then people started believing or selling those earthly stories as if they were true. And that's the development that Christianity led to, and that's the Christianity that we're talking about today is the result of the people believing that they, these myths uh, were actually true. So why is that credible? Uh, well, let's survey the evidence on that. Uh, the first thing to look at is, are the trends in Hellenistic religion of the time. This is the, these are trends that were already evident across the Roman Empire, and including throughout the Middle East, uh, just before Christianity arose. Uh, the best reference on this is Petra Pekenen, uh, interpreting early Hellenistic religion. And she documents that there were four big trends in religion in the centuries leading up to Christianity, and that Christianity conforms to all four. She doesn't specifically talk about Christianity. Uh, this is my analysis. But nevertheless, she thoroughly demonstrates the trends and their existence and their widespread uh, effect in the ancient world. Now, those four trends are, first, Syncretism. Uh, syncretism is the combining of a foreign cult deity with Hellenistic elements. So you take ideas from one culture and ideas from another culture, or ideas from one religion or ideas from another, and merge them. The result, of course, is going to be something that's different from both of the original products, because it's going to have pieces from one and pieces from the other, and it's going to leave pieces behind from either as well. Uh, but this is very common. Uh, this is one of the trends that we're seeing, is we're seeing that some local national cult is being combined with Greek ideas, the Greek mystery religion model, to create a new religion that's a, a merger, a combination, or a hybrid of both. A monotheistic trend is another one. Uh, a lot of times you hear that the, the Christians and the Jews were the only monotheists against polytheists. That's actually not the case. The trend in polytheism at the time, there was this big trend of transforming polytheism into monotheism via a mid-stage called henotheism. Now, henotheism is the view that there's one supreme god and all the other gods are subordinate deities in one fashion or another. Usually they're created by uh, the master deity. Now, if you realize Judaism is actually henotheistic because you have God and he created all these angels and there are all these demons and there's Satan and so on. And these things all have the exact same powers as pagan gods. So in reality, the Jews were just engaging in an Orwellian semantic game. They were calling them angels and demons, but in reality, they're, they're, a pagan would look at that system and go, that's just my system. I, that's the gods. I have the same belief system. You have one supreme deity and all these subordinate deities. Some are good and some are bad. 
it's kind of the same thing. But this trend was growing at the time, uh, and there are many different, uh, the mystery cults in, in particular were growing in this direction of the idea of a supreme deity with the subordinate deities, and, and Christianity fits into that myth, that section as well. And individualism. Uh, this is very important. This was one of the biggest trends of Hellenistic religion that, that's importantly overlooked. Oftentimes when you hear criticism of the Jesus myth theory, people who are criticizing it aren't aware of this fact. And that's the fact that what began as agricultural salvation cults. There are a lot of these, for example, I'll talk about a little bit later, dying and rising god cults. Uh, these cults are, began as agricultural metaphors. The, the god dies and rises with the seasons and with the agricultural stuff. And that the religion was involved in ensuring the crops would grow. It was basically targeted towards the community and towards uh, uh, fertility of the whole region, for example. These cults were specifically being transformed during the Hellenistic period into personal salvation cults. The exact same gods, the exact same stories, the exact same metaphors were now being mapped onto personal salvation. So instead of agricultural fertility every year and a community event, it would be an individual gaining his own personal resurrection or salvation through the metaphor of the gods' death and resurrection. And another one is cosmopolitanism. This is the fourth trend. Uh, this is the idea that all races, cultures, classes could be merged together and be treated as equals. That there, they, there was no difference between race and nation and so on. We could all be one brotherhood and that we were all uh, sharing uh, contact with or parts of God in ourselves. And they were developing fictive kinship groups where all members would call each other brothers and sisters and so on. And one of the big changes was from early polytheism, you would have public cults you didn't have to believe, you didn't necessarily have to participate. They were just, there were ceremonies conducted publicly, maybe public holidays and so forth. Uh, it wasn't something that you chose whether to join or believe in. One of the big trends of the mystery religions is to change that trend so that now you join a religion uh, rather than being born into it. You actually pick a religion, you engage in an initiation ceremony and, be, and voluntarily become a part of that cult. And it becomes something that you believe in and something that you rely upon individually. So those are the four trends, and you can see how Christianity is kind of looking like uh, it fits right into this system of trends. Now the trend in action uh, we see here, this is a list of several of the mystery religions we know predated Christianity, uh, and you can see the trend here. The Eleusinian and Dionysian mysteries, uh, the Bacchic mysteries, were also uh, very popular, date hundreds of years before Christianity. They combined Hellenistic ideas, this Hellenistic mystery cult concept, with Phoenician, Western Syrian concepts. Uh, so they're basically this, this different cult in the Middle East was being merged with Greek ideas to create this new kind of religion. Uh, the mysteries of Attis and Kibale, uh, that combined Hellenistic elements with Phrygian, which is Northern Turkish at the time, uh, cult ideas. So this, this Northern Turkish, this Phrygian religion was being merged with this Greek mystery religion model to create a new hybrid, a new religion that's, that's unlike both in various respects. Then we have mysteries of Jupiter Dolicanus, which combined Hellenistic with Anatolian, which is Western Turkish religion. We have the mysteries of Mithras, which brought us Mithraism, that combines Hellenistic elements with Persian, uh, Persian religious ideas and Persian cult ideas. Then we have the mysteries of Isis and Osiris, which combined this Hellenistic mystery religion model with Egyptian religion and created a new religion like that. When we look at Christianity, what we're seeing is this exact same trend, a local national cult, the Jewish cult, uh, the Palestinian cult, being combined with Hellenistic elements, this mystery model, to make a new religion, just like all of these others. You, you, just as you have uh, Osiris cult as an Egyptian mystery religion, just as Mithras cult as a Persian mystery religion, Christianity is a Jewish version of a mystery religion. And there were this trend of dying and rising gods that I mentioned before, that were originally agricultural gods but became gods of individual salvation. There are at least three of them. There's actually a few more that we can confirm in evidence predate Christianity. There are a few where the evidence post-dates Christianity, but there are several, there are pl several in plenty uh, that we can confirm predate Christianity because we have evidence definitely predating Christianity of them. Uh, one is Romulus, which was the Roman state god. Uh, his death and resurrection was actually celebrated in annual passion plays. Uh, this was part of uh, Roman imperial cult at the time, so it would be very well known. Uh, Osiris was the Egyptian god, and that was one of the most popular cults, Isis and Osiris cult throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, and those baptized into his death and resurrection would be saved in the afterlife. It was one of the fundamental teachings of Osiris cult. And then there was Zalmoxis cult, for example, which is a Thracian god. His death and resurrection also assured followers of an eternal life. So you can see this trend already. Uh, Christianity is just another version of this same trend. <coughs> 
And I talk about these and others in Not the Impossible Faith. So this is the book if you want to get up to speed on that. I'll talk about it more, of course, in my next book on the historicity of Jesus Christ. But if you can't wait for that, uh, this is the book uh, that you'll want to look for. Uh, all my books are also available on Kindle, of course. But I want to clarify here, because when I talk about this dying and rising God trend, this idea that Christianity has evolved from this uh, prior model, I don't want to uh, make you think that I'm endorsing all of the parallels that have been claimed. Uh, there are a lot of parallels that you'll see on the internet and, in, and books, often by amateurs, claiming that all the attributes of Jesus come from other gods, like, for example, the, his birth date on December 25th and various things like that. Uh, no, that's not necessarily the case. A lot of those attributes, like, for example, Jesus being born on December 25th, were added to him much later anyway, so they have nothing to do with the origin of Christianity. Uh, and there are many attributes, for example, his having 12 disciples that probably do not come from any prior, uh, uh, any prior disciples, any prior God who had disciples and all of that. Uh, so there are a lot of these claims that are dubious. So you have to make sure that you can tell the difference between the dubious claims and the claims that we actually can prove uh, predate. Christianity. And it's also important, you often hear Mithras listed as one of the dying and rising gods. This is an example of one of the bad claims that goes around among mythicists. Uh, Mithras, we have no evidence that Mithras was a dying and rising god. Uh, what we can tell, is, and what you see here is this is an inscription that's basically a comic book version of the Gospel of Mithras. Uh, no one preserved the text. We know the texts existed, but the Christians didn't preserve it. So all we have is this picture Bible version, and we have to kind of guess what the scenes mean. Uh, and the best that we can tell is that he undergoes some sort of great uh, difficult struggle, uh, some great suffering involved in battling this giant bull that somehow gives him the ability to ascend to heaven and gain power over death. And we're not sure exactly uh, what happened, but it had something to do with this great struggle. But it wasn't him himself dying as far as we can tell. But what all these gods do have in common, even the ones that don't, like Mithras, who don't explicitly die and rise again, these are the things that they do all have in common. And there, there are probably like, at least half a dozen up to a dozen of these gods that predate Christianity. They're all savior gods, and they're all called the son of God. There are a few occasions of daughters of God who are also these savior deities. Uh, they all undergo a passion, and it was the exact same Greek word was used for their suffering, whatever story of their suffering that gave them power over death. It's called a passion in the exact same Greek word uh, in all of these cults, as far as we know. They all obtain victory over death, uh, which they share with their followers. That was one of the central teachings of these gods, Mithras included. And they all, have stories, uh, they all have stories about them set in human history on Earth, important, yet none of them ever actually existed, as far as we know, and we have no reason to believe any of them existed. So to see Jesus as the sole exception to this trend, that he's the only one who actually existed, already is looking like an extraordinary claim. We're going to need some pretty good evidence to go against that and say that he existed, but Mithras didn't, for example. But again, they, they weren't all born on December 25th, and neither was Jesus for more than a century, etc. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit of the Jewish background. Remember, we're talking about syncretism. They took some of the pagan ideas, merged them with some Jewish ideas to create a new hybrid. What were some of the Jewish ideas that went into this? Philo of Alexandria writes between the 20s and 40s AD, uh, shortly before the time of Paul uh, and right around the time of Christ supposedly. Uh, and if you want more, the, not the impossible faith, I have the sources uh, that I, of the things I'm about to talk about. But in his writings, Philo of Alexandria tells us that there was already a pre-Christian Jewish belief in a celestial being who was actually named Jesus. So there's already a celestial being named Jesus who was called the firstborn son of God, who was the celestial image of God, who was God's agent of creation, and God's celestial high priest. Now, this is important because every single one of these is a Christian belief that we can find in the letters of Paul, except for the high priest bit, which we find in Hebrews, so, which is a very early text, I believe. So what we're looking at here, the, the earliest books that we have, the earliest texts of Christianity that we have, all are talking about Jesus as the same Jesus figure that Philo is talking about, the celestial deity uh, that was not an incarnate god. He was a celestial god from the beginning. Um, it's clear that somehow the Christians came into believing that this, this celestial Jesus came to earth, assumed the form of a man, uh, or, or if he came to earth at all, at all, that's the question we're going to ask, but he assumed the form of a man and then died and rose back to heaven and so on. So whether it, you're talking about historicity, a historical Jesus, or a non-historical Jesus, we have to deal with the fact that Christianity began as a belief that that Jesus was this Jesus. This, he was already a celestial Jesus even before Christianity came around. <clears throat> 
And uh, to give you an example, Philippians 2 gives us the earliest example of one of the earliest Christian creeds. And all it basically says there is that the, the Christians believe that this pre-existent being, because it, it refers to him as a pre-existent being, it clearly identifies him as this Jesus, uh, having descended, becoming incarnate, dying, and rising again. And then we find in other passages uh, that he appeared to select people to tell them all about this. On the most plausible mythicist theory, this incarnation, death, and burial took place in outer space just below the moon, rather than on Earth. It was a celestial event. Now, you might think that's crazy. In fact, it has precedence. The exact same thing was taught of Osiris. Uh, there were public stories for Osiris, for, for the riffraff, basically, for the outsiders, that put him on Earth in history, that you hemorrhized Osiris. But the private stories, the stories told to initiates and so on, had it that his death and resurrection occurred in outer space just below the moon. Uh, so we have already precedence for this concept of a celestial dying and rising. We also have precedence in the Jewish belief system. For example, Adam, uh, in some Jewish texts, Adam was believed to have been buried in outer space. He's actually in the third heaven, which I think is somewhere around the region of Venus or Mars, uh, if you're curious to go looking for him. Um, so it is positive. There were, and if you look at the descriptions, Jewish descriptions of heaven, uh, they, they, there's dirt, there's trees, there's temples, uh, there's thrones, there's all kinds of things in all the levels of heaven. Uh, in fact, we find texts that refer to, uh, Christian texts and Jewish texts that refer to the fact that there are copies of things in heaven. And I'm going to talk about that. Basically, everything on earth has some version, some copy of it in the sky. And in fact, it was believed that the versions on earth were the copies of the true versions in heaven. So if there's cats on earth, there's cats in heaven, for example. Uh, anything you could think of, uh, there were things there. So you could be buried in heaven. There was dirt to be buried in there. There were tombs to be buried in there. So it wasn't an implausible idea in terms of the cosmology of the time. Now, one of the important texts that clues us in on this, and you have to remember that the Christian church that survived is the church that, that bet everything on the historical Jesus. It was depending on the historical Jesus for selling its particular dogma. And so it either destroyed or let rot any texts uh, that disagreed with that view. So a lot of the heretical Christian texts, a lot of the early Christian texts uh, disappeared for one reason or another. It doesn't, didn't require an organized conspiracy. It's just that the various churches just had no interest in or at, individually against preserving these texts. And so the net result was that we don't have them today. But some things slip through just barely. Uh, the Ascension of Isaiah is one that's filled with clues. The Ascension of Isaiah is a late 1st or early 2nd century gospel. It's a form of gospel. It's very different from the gospels we have because what it is is it's a story of the prophet Isaiah goes into a trance. This is, this is Isaiah from the Old Testament. So this is some sort of secret lost text, supposedly. Obviously, it's a forgery. This never really happened. <clears throat> but the prophet Isaiah received a vision, and then the whole text goes on to relate what his vision was. And in that vision, uh, he's talking about, uh, basically says there's, he was brought up through the seven levels of heaven. He's taught that there's the copies, there's versions of things in, in the lower heavens that are copies of the thing. Just below the moon, for example, he's taken up. And Satan and the demons control the outer space region below the moon and are battling each other in outer space there. Uh, and there, there, there are versions of things on earth are also up there in, in that version of heaven. And he kept the angel that's bringing him up through this ascension is bringing him up to other levels of heaven. So he goes to the first level, the second level, and so on, all the way to the seventh level of heaven. Just so you know, there's seven levels of heaven. And, uh, and, and he brings up, he gets up there, gets a tour of these heavens, and then is taught at the top that God tells him, well, here's, you're going to meet Jesus. Jesus, I'm going to send him down. He's going to defeat the devil uh, and then come back up and be Lord of the universe and so on. Uh, and then after God explains what Jesus is going to do, uh, Jesus does it. And Isaiah is there uh, as if he's like looking into the future, seeing uh, Jesus descend and engage in all this activity and ascend and all of that. So this is how this text proceeds. In the earliest redaction of this, which we can reconstruct uh, through a literary analysis and from the fact that we have manuscripts that lack key parts of it, uh, there was no visit to Earth. Jesus doesn't make it to Earth. He d it appears to die and be killed by the devil in outer space, by the devil and his demons, and is buried and resurrected there and then rises from there. Uh, for example, in, in the main text, the text we have from the Ethiopian church, for example, there's a, there's a whole earthly gospel tacked in where he, he gets to earth, he's born to Mary, Pontius Pilate crucifies him and the whole deal. Uh, but that whole pocket gospel doesn't fit the style of the rest of the text. So we know it's actually an interpolation. Someone inserted that text. Now we have versions of the text in Latin, for example, uh, and in various other languages like Slavonic that lack this tacked in gospel. So we know it wasn't there originally. Um, 
And there are various other arguments that you can pose to show this. So once you take that out, what you have left is a Jesus who descends only to the level of this uh, outer space just below the moon where he's killed by the demons and, and the devil, not by Pontius Pilate and the Jews. So Jesus is crucified by Satan in outer space in the earliest redaction of this gospel. Now the narrative, there are many aspects of this narrative that are very similar to another narrative that dates back 2,000 years before Christ, which is the descent of Inanna. Uh, Inanna, uh, also known as Astarte and various other uh, names, uh, in the Sumerian religion, she also, but she, instead of going through the levels of, descending through the levels of heaven, she descended through the levels of hell uh, and was killed by a death spell by the, the god of hell. Uh, and then her naked body was nailed up. So she's basically crucified. Uh, and then some of her helpers came down to resurrect her. And it was all part of her plan for this to happen. And she's resurrected and she ascends back up through the levels of hell and, and the story proceeds from there. Uh, now this is another example of one of those dying and rising god cults that was originally an agricultural <laughs> cult. Uh, we have evidence that possibly this cult survived in other forms, but we don't have a lot of evidence of that. But the fact that there are so many similarities with this ancient Sumerian tale and the ascension of Isaiah is enough proof that some version of the story survived and that whoever wrote the ascension of Isaiah is actually uh, borrowing elements from this descent of Anana story, this other resurrection God story. So let's get to Paul's letters. These, these are the earliest letters we have. And you have to remember that the 13 or so letters of Paul that are in the New Testament, only seven of them are agreed to be authentic. The others are all forgeries. Um, basically, all mainstream scholars agree that those other letters are forgeries, so we can throw them out uh, one way or another and just refer to the seven that we think are authentic and talk about those. Now, in those letters, Paul says things like this in Galatians. Brothers, the gospel I preached does not come from a man. Neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So notice those words, very careful the vocabulary he's using to describe where his gospel come f comes from. It comes from revelation. It doesn't come from Jesus. It doesn't come from human oral testimony. It came from direct revelation. He had a vision of Jesus. So when we get to 1 Corinthians where he says, brothers, the gospel I preached is what I also received, he's talking about the same thing. This is the same vocabulary, almost the same phrase word for word. Uh, about his revelation. So he's talking about what was revealed to him by Jesus. And what was revealed to him was this, that according to the scriptures, Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that according to the scriptures, he was raised on the third day and that he appeared to Kephas and various other early Christian apostles and, la and at last he appeared to me as well. Now what's important here, uh, as I'll point out in a moment, is that the appearing part only comes later. <clears throat> And when we get to 1 Corinthians 11.23, we have again, I received from the Lord, same vocabulary, what I also delivered to you, again the same vocabulary, that on the night he was handed over, the Lord took bread and so on, the whole Lord's Supper idea. What that's going to tell us, very importantly, uh, well, let's get to that. Let's talk about the thing just before. Uh, note that Jesus is not said to appear, not said to have appeared before his death. People only see him after his death. Now notice that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 8, there's no mention of Jesus being seen or known before his death. So there's no mention of disciples going on a mission with him. There's no mention of a ministry in Galilee. Uh, and in fact, the only sources he has appear to be the scriptures for that stuff. The first time there's any mention of Jesus appearing to anyone, of anyone ever seeing Jesus, is the risen Jesus, the revelatory Jesus, the celestial Jesus, not the earthly Jesus. Oops. Let's try that again. And when he says according to the scriptures, he uses a particular form of the Greek that normally is how you cite sources. Uh, it could mean, for example, what the way Christians normally interpret it is, these things happened and they happened in fulfillment of the scriptures. That's usually the way that you hear it interpreted. But the phrase normally and usually and most commonly means uh, that this is his source, that it means according to the scriptures, as in according to Josephus or according to Isaiah or whatever the case may be, that these things happen. So what it looks like Paul is actually doing here is he's saying that we learn about Christ's death and that he was buried and that was raised on the third day. We learn about those things not from it, anyone having seen it, but from the fact that they're written in the scriptures. The scriptures tell us that these things happened. Uh, and that it was, would have been the revelation of Jesus that would have explained this to him. So when we get to uh, Paul talking about the Lord's Supper, and this is the only uh, actual kind of narrative that Paul ever references uh, that have anything uh, of, a, of a story about Jesus. Uh, he says he received it from the Lord. 
That means that Paul, we said this exact same vocabulary. It's, once again, it means Paul hallucinated the Last Supper. That means he received teachings from the dead Jesus, and he's even quoting things that Jesus said on this occasion. And it's important to note that when he tells the story of the Lord's Supper, there are no disciples present. In fact, it doesn't appear that Jesus is talking to disciples. It appears that Jesus is talking basically to Paul or to future Christians when he uh, engages in the Lord's Supper. There's no reference to Judas in particular. You'll see certain Bibles will translate the delivered or when uh, the night that he was handed over They'll translate it as the night he was betrayed because the word is the same. But in fact, it's the word handed over. And when Paul uses that word throughout the Gospels, he means when God himself handed Jesus over or when Jesus handed him over, himself over. He's talking about basically delivering Jesus to be sacrificed. He's not, there's no mention there that we can tell about a betrayal by Judas, for example. So it appears to be some sort of event in outer space that Paul learned about through revelation, not through oral transmission. Throughout Paul's letters, uh, we find the same pattern. Scripture and revelation are the only sources of information that Paul ever mentions anyone having. He never refers to oral testimony. He never refers to anyone, any information he has. He never refers to an eyewitness having told him or someone passing it on to him from an eyewitness. Uh, th that never occurs. The only time he ever references sources of information, his sources of information are always scripture or personal private revelation. And the Jesus he knows and refers to and speaks to is always in outer space. It's always a cosmic Jesus. There's, there's never an occasion where we can clearly identify Paul talking about a Jesus on earth. And he never connects him to human history. He never says, for example, uh, that Jesus was crucified by Pontius Pilate. That there's, at no point in Paul's letters does he clearly connect Jesus to history in that fashion. Now there are passages that challenge this theory. I'll address the most significant ones. There are a lot of minor ones that are easy to dismiss, but these are the big ones, the ones you might hear about most often. That Lord's Supper passage, you say, well, he talks about the Lord's Supper, so that must have happened. That must be historical. But as we saw, Paul says, Paul himself says he received it from the Lord, just like he says he received the gospel itself. So he received that information by revelation. So we can't actually tie that to a historical event that was actually witnessed by anyone on earth. Uh, and there's a passage where it says uh, Jesus would, was crucified by the rulers of this age. Now, actually, the, ru the phrase rulers of this age in the Greek is a common term for demons, actually. So there's, there's actually, uh, there's a lot of times Paul and other writers use that phrase or similar phrases to refer not to earthly powers, not to the Romans, not to the Jews, but in fact to the cosmic powers, to the forces of Satan. And notably, in this passage, in 1 Corinthians 2, where he talks about Jesus Christ being crucified by the rulers of this age, his specific point there is that they killed him, but they wouldn't have killed them if they knew it would bring the world's salvation. And thus, his identity was concealed from them so that they would kill him, not knowing uh, that this would end death and, and, and end their power and so on. Uh, this is very important because this certainly sounds like the Ascension of Isaiah. This is the story that's told in the Ascension of Isaiah, where it's the demons who don't want to lose their power. It's the demons who are in control of death and, and are ruling the sub-world. The sub and that's a key point because if, if Paul was talking about the Romans here, it wouldn't make any sense. If the Romans knew that killing Jesus would save the universe, they wouldn't have any motive to not do it. They would, oh, well, let's kill Jesus. That's a great idea then. Uh, the Jews, the same way. If the Jews knew that, that Jesus Christ was the genuine Messiah of God and that his death was planned by God and would bring about a great salvation, uh, they would go ahead and kill him anyway. What he's talking about are pe people, some sort of beings, who would not kill Jesus, who would, who would avoid killing Jesus if they knew that doing so would end death in the world and would, would give Jesus Christ cosmic victory, not just worldly, earthly victory. So it seems very clear that Paul is talking about uh, spiritual persons, spiritual powers, not powers who, who, are, who don't want to end their reign over death and their control of death over people. It doesn't sound like he's talking about Romans or Jews. Uh, there's a passage in 1 Thessalonians, however, where Paul is made to say that the Jews are the ones who killed Jesus. Uh, that passage, however, is an interpolation. It was added later. Uh, now, th this can be debated. We don't have direct evidence that it was done, uh, but I think the argument to be made that it was an interpolation and not written by Paul is very strong. Uh, and if you want to see that case, you can Google Richard Carrier Pauline interpolations. Uh, that blog that I've written uh, cites the scholarship, because there are a lot of scholars who agree with me on this. Uh, not, and these are not scholars who believe Jesus didn't exist, so these are mainstream scholars. Uh, they also agree that this passage was interpolated, so we can, we can rule this out as evidence. This is something that, that later Christian scribes added to the text.
Uh, then there's also another passage where it said that, uh, where Paul is made to say that, that Jesus confessed before Pontius Pilate. So here's what, what kind of passage that we really want, something connecting Jesus to human history. Uh, but this is in 1 Timothy, and pretty much everyone agrees that that letter is a forgery. Paul never wrote it. Uh, so we can rule that out. Similarly, 2 Peter talks about witnessing Jesus during the transfiguration. But 2 Peter, everyone agrees, is a forgery. So that evidence can be thrown out. Uh, so these, these things don't actually uh, support the historicity of Jesus because they're, they're falsified evidence. The next, uh, next and pretty much the, the best case that they can come up with, the historicists can come up with to try and refute mythicist theory, is to claim that Paul mentions the earthly family of Jesus. And there are, there are a few passages where that, that could be the case. There are two passages where he refers to brothers of the Lord. Um, but the problem is we don't know if this means biological or adoptive brothers because in fact all Christians, or let's be more specific, all baptized Christians were brothers of the Lord. And this is some of the fundamental teachings of Paul. Uh, if you look at some of my blogs on this, you'll find some of the, the passages referencing it. But in fact, Paul frequently talks about the fact that when we get baptized, we become adopted by God and therefore become the brothers of the Lord, become the brothers of Jesus. That in fact, Jesus, Paul explicitly says, Jesus was the firstborn of many brethren. The many brethren meaning the other brothers, meaning the Christians. So in fact, all Christians are brothers of the Lord. So we don't know which sense of brothers of the Lord that Paul is using in these two passages. And a whole debate swirls around what we can infer from the way he uses it as to whether he means biological or adoptive brothers, whether he just means Christians or not. And there are other ways to interpret this passage. It's, it's, this is probably the weakest pillar that you can rest historicity on. And it's really the only evidence, that, there's really the only thing that they have uh, to, to maintain the case for the historicity of Jesus. I think it's far too weak. Uh, then there's a passage where he's supposedly born of the sperm of David, or born of the seed of David, as you'll see the, the polite uh, biblical translation, it's actually sperm. Uh, but in fact, the word is not the word that you, would, that you or Paul would normally use for born. It's the word for made. It's the word for uh, came to be. Uh, so it's actually a, a more indirect phrase. It's actually made of the sperm of David rather than literally born from the sperm of David. Now, it could mean born from the sperm of David in a metaphorical sense, uh, but the fact that, that that thing is there, that, that strangeness is there, is telling. And in fact, later Christian scribes, and, and Bart Ehrman, for example, is one of the scholars who's proven this, later Christian scribes were bothered by the fact that it wasn't the word for born, that it was the word for made, so they started trying to change it. And we have evidence in the manuscripts of, in later centuries of them trying to erase this and, and revise it to make it the word for born rather than the word for made. So we know that they were bothered by this already. Uh, and it's important to note that scripturally, the flesh of the Christ, the flesh of the Messiah, had to be Jewish and from David. This was thoroughly throughout the Old Testament, thoroughly throughout Jewish apocalyptic literature of the time. So it was something that, if you're going to be a mythicist, if you're going to develop a mythicist theory, you had to come up somehow, some way, to explain how your cosmic Jesus that you believe in uh, was of the flesh of David. And the basic idea was uh, that he would, as the Ascension of Isaiah explains, he comes down and just below the moon, assumes a human-like body, a body of flesh, and then that body is what is killed, and then he rises again from that. Uh, but that flesh had to be Jewish and it had to be Davidic. And there's lots of good examples, like for example, 2 Samuel 7, where God appears to say, in fact, in, in the plain terms of what he says, is he says to David, King David himself, that I will take sperm from your belly and from that I will uh, basically make a king who, a descendant of yours, or she doesn't even use the word descendant, he says, I'll make a king who will rule forever. Now, of course, if you're reading this and you believe that God would never lie, you'd notice that that never happened. In fact, the, the royal line was cut off and, and wasn't even uh, operating at the time that Christianity uh, came about. So obviously there was no eternal throne of David, uh, and certainly there was no immortal king, right? Because if he's saying there's, there's one guy that he's going to make from the sperm of David who's going to rule forever. So what do you do? You say, well, God took, this passage says that God took sperm from uh, David's, uh, David's belly, uh, literally, and, uh, and then would, from it would create an eternal ruler. Well, obviously what you might conclude is that God it basically has a cosmic sperm bank, that he took this sperm from the belly of David and is holding it in reserve in outer space until the time that he's going to make a messiah out of it, a messiah who will rule forever, not, not just your ordinary uh, temporary living messiah or temporary living king, but a king who would live forever and rule on the throne forever. So there are ways to explain why mythicists or early uh, uh, Jesus uh, cultists who would believe in this cosmic Jesus and this cosmically incarnated Jesus would say that he was born of the sperm of David. They had to say it scripturally and they had obvious and easy ways uh, to come up with cosmic explanations for how that could be. Uh, 
And then the next passage is, uh, uses the same word, by the way. It's made of a woman, not born of a woman. Um, uh, so this other passage uh, where he says that Jesus is, or the Lord was uh, born of a woman slash made of a woman. Uh, but in context, and this is in Galatians 4, this is allegorical. In fact, Paul goes on to explain very explicitly that we are born from the same woman, this, what he calls the slave girl who represents the corrupt world subject to Torah law. And that thanks to Jesus, we will one day be reborn of another woman, uh, the free woman, who is the, the, the woman of the celestial world. Uh, and that is what happens through baptism, is that you're reborn to a new mother, but it's an allegorical mother. It's not an actual literal mother. You don't crawl into some woman's womb and get reborn, literally. Uh, but at the same time, so that means that when he says that Jesus was born of a woman and born under the law, he's using the same allegory. So he's talking about the same allegorical concept, that Jesus was symbolically born of the corrupt flesh, the corrupt flesh of the corrupt world order, uh, so that the corrupt world order could die with him. And that's all part of the, the Christian cosmology of the time. So this in itself does not attest uh, that there was an actual literal historical woman that he was born to. Another example is the book of Hebrews. Now, this is in the New Testament. Uh, we know Paul did not write it. Uh, someone who knew a companion of Paul claims to have written it. We don't know its date. It doesn't say when it was written. Uh, but there are parts of it that fundamentally assume and in fact require for its argument to hold that the Jewish temple cult was still in operation, which means that it was probably written around 60 AD, probably after Paul had died, uh, roughly 60 AD, so probably after around the time Paul had died, but before the Jewish war, uh, when the temple was destroyed and the temple cult was ended in 70 AD. Uh, now, there are several scholars who would agree with me on that. There are several other scholars who want to date it later. I think when you look at the evidence, I'm not going to go through it here, but when you look at the evidence, it's pretty strong that it has to predate the year 70. So this would be an early text. In this, we have no historical Jesus in the ordinary sense. Again, in this, it just says that Jesus passed through the heavens and poured his blood out on a celestial altar in outer space. And in fact, it explicitly repeats the doctrine of copies, that there are copies of things in the heavens uh, that are more perfect versions of things on the earth, and that Jesus' blood had to fall on the perfect copies in order for his uh, magic mojo to work and save the universe. Now, this is curious because this looks a lot like the Ascension of Isaiah. This looks like the same story. It looks like the author of Hebrews knows the Ascension of Isaiah story or something like it. And is, that's the story that he thinks is true. Uh, the book of Hebrews mentions only one narrative event in the life of Jesus, and that's, it talks about him praying to God uh, before, uh, before his death, praying to God for salvation. And the curious thing about this is in the Gospels, Jesus prays uh, and, and, and anguishes about the possibility of being released from the burden of doing this. Uh, but then he, he prays, yes, I'll do your will, and so on. He doesn't pray to be resurrected, uh, whereas in the Hebrews, this version, this story, he's praying to be resurrected. So it's a different story than we find in the Gospels. And again, this could be part of the revelatory message that was received. There's no definite proof in the way that, in the context of this, or the way it's talked about, that this occurred on earth. Uh, it, again, the book of Hebrews mentions no sources of information other than revelation or scripture. Uh, and that, that's important. It often will even like quote Jesus, and when it's quoting Jesus, it's actually just quoting scripture. So it, it appears to believe that whoever wrote scripture was possessed by Jesus or something, and was actually, com Jesus was communicating to them through scripture. Uh, there's, at no point in Hebrews does he refer to eyewitnesses transmitting things that Jesus said. Uh, it has no knowledge of any gospel narratives. Even that narrative of him praying before he died doesn't match up exactly with the gospel narratives. So the gospel narratives seem completely unknown to the author of Hebrews. And more importantly, there's a section of it where he says, the author of Hebrews says, if Jesus were on earth, he would not be a priest. But, his reasoning goes, he continues to argue, because he was not on earth, he was a priest. He was the, the high priest of God's celestial temple. He was the, the supreme high priest, essentially, this, this cosmic high priest. Now, the significant part of this is that this argument only makes sense if you believe that Jesus was never on earth, right? Because if Jesus came to earth, then he couldn't be a priest. That's his own argument. But it, he needs Jesus to be a priest for his sacrifice to work. So therefore, Jesus' sacrifice had to have occurred in, in celestial realms. It couldn't have occurred on earth for this author. It wouldn't make sense for his argument for that to have been the case. So it appears that whoever wrote Hebrews was someone who believed in the celestial uh, outer space dying Jesus and not the earthly Jesus of later Gospels. Another letter is 1 Clement. Traditionally, this is dated to 95 AD. We have no actual evidence that that's the case. And in fact, like Hebrews, 1 Clement engages in arguments that implicitly assume and require uh, that the Jewish temple cult was still in operation. So again, it looks like this letter was written before, 
before 70 AD when the Jewish temple cult was concluded. But in any case, it was certainly written between 60 and 95 AD. It was written again after the death of Paul, and it refers to the death of Paul as something that had occurred recently. In this, again, there's no clear mention of an earthly Jesus. Uh, oftentimes you'll see historicity defenders citing one Clement as evidence for historicity, but when you go look at the passages they cite, they, they don't support any such contention. There actually is no clear mention of, a, of an earthly Jesus in it. It has no knowledge of any gospel narratives. It ne there's many opportunities in one Clement to use a gospel narrative to make a point or an argument that the author is making, but he doesn't. He doesn't seem to be aware that he has that rich uh, piece of information to use. And again, this letter only cites Revelation and Scripture as his only sources of information about Jesus. In fact, there are many cases where he explicitly cites, he's, I'm quoting Jesus here, basically says something like that, and then again quotes Scripture. Uh, so apparently his information is coming from Scripture. He doesn't seem to have the notion of uh, information passed on. Uh, he does refer to apostles. He refers to God delivering Jesus to the apostles and the apostles transmitting information, but he doesn't actually quote that information. But again, it sounds like what he's talking about are God having Jesus reveal himself to the apostles and the apostles being the only ones to have seen and heard him, then it was required for the apostles to spread the gospel around. There doesn't seem to be any clear mention of Jesus having an earthly ministry and having met or engaged with other people. And this, all this, despite the fact that one Clement is over 10,000 words long, with many occasions of relevance to mention uh, the, the earthly Jesus in, in clearer ways. So this letter looks like it was written by someone who didn't believe in a historical Jesus, who didn't even have any notion of the idea yet. So that leaves the Gospels. When we get to the Gospels, the Gospels comes, come decades after the fact. And at least 40 years, the earliest Gospel of Mark comes at least, through, at least 40 years after when Jesus is supposed to have died. Uh, and the Gospels are the first we hear of an earthly story for Jesus. The Gospels are wildly fictitious in their content and structure, uh, and, and, and more so than you probably even know. Uh, yesterday at, uh, uh, at University campus at Raleigh, I did a whole lecture on this, and that will eventually be online, which you can watch, where I explain why the Gospels are through and through myth. Uh, they, they're making everything up. Uh, I won't go any further into that uh, here. But every story in the Gospels has discernible allegorical or propagandistic intent. So it's clear that these are stories that they're making up. It looks like they're euhemerizing Jesus, putting him in history and making up stories about him, just as was done to every other celestial deity that we know about. And the first of these, Mark, in fact, looks like an extended meta-parable. Uh, outsiders are told one story, while insiders are told what it really means, what the real story is. And we have this, Mark even clues us in on this by having Jesus say, and when he was alone with his disciples, he said to them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, outsiders, all these things are said in parables, so that seeing they may see, but not perceive, and hearing they may hear, but not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. This is a clue. He's basically saying uh, the, the whole gospel I'm writing is like this. It's a parable. Uh, to outsiders, it's going to look like a story of a historical Jesus. To insiders, it's full of rich uh, uh, allegorical and symbolic information. And if you want more on this, uh, the Gospels as parables, uh, these are uh, texts to look at. The Gospel Fictions, again, is a great one because it's short and really persuasive and effective. Uh, does the New Testament imitate Homer is an example showing how uh, the, the book of Acts is bullshit, for example. Um, and the power of parable, uh, in the power of parable, John Dominic Crossan argues very effectively for a lay audience that the Gospels are parables about Jesus, so that in fact the Gospels are fiction. Uh, and, and they're using the concept of a parable, but casting Jesus as the central character. And I talk more about these things in Proving History as well. Uh, we can talk about canonical acts. I don't have a lot of time to go into it in more detail, uh, but there's actually evidence from acts in terms of what doesn't happen that doesn't make any sense. Just as one example, uh, the, the private history of the church concludes at the end of Acts 1. The public history of the church begins at Acts 2. And in Acts 1, uh, Jesus' mom and his brothers are with the, the are with the disciples and with the early church. Beginning with Acts 2 and all the way to the end of Acts, for many, many, many chapters, they disappear from history. They, they never say anything, they never do anything, no one ever refers to them. It's as if they didn't exist. There are no brothers of Jesus involved in the church. Uh, the mother of Jesus just disappears. No one even notices that she's vanished. Uh, it's strange. It looks like the book of Acts is embellishing a core early story of the history of the church that lacked any reference to the family of Jesus. Uh, and there are many other aspects of Acts that are like that, that, that look like clues to the fact that the original story didn't have a historical Jesus in it.
And one way to, to if, you, if you're still being given the rigor moral from Christian apologists that Acts is a really reliable history, uh, read The Mystery of Acts by Richard Pervo. It's another short, brilliant text that will completely disavow you of the, the, the concept that Acts is reliable. It's, it's, it's made up, uh, thoroughly made up. Uh, it's important to point out life expectancy. Oftentimes they'll say, well, the eyewitnesses would still be around. Well, that's not really the case. Um, if you were 20 years old when Jesus died, in fact, you would almost certainly be dead uh, by the year 70 AD. You'd have maybe a 1 in 4 chance of still being alive at that time. You'd have a 1 in 10 chance of still being alive in the year 80, and a 1 in 200 chance of still being alive in the year, one ni or the year 95. So the Gospels were being written exactly when the eyewitnesses were all dying off. Uh, and in fact, by the time the Gospel of Luke comes, before the Gospel of John comes, the odds are extremely low that there are any eyewitnesses still alive. And then there's, there's no other evidence. Everything else is either not independent, meaning that it's just relying, they just echo the Gospels or what Christians said the Gospels say. So you can't use that in evidence because if they're just, they're just aping the Gospels, they're getting their information from the Gospels, that's not a corroboration of the Gospels. Or it's fabricated. There are tons of fabricated evidence, like the infancy Gospels, where Jesus is this terrible, uh, awful, you know, omen-like child who does all these horrible miracles as, as, a, as a young kid, proving how awesome he is. Uh, and there's other things. Jesus, we have a letter from Jesus, for example. I don't bet you didn't know that. Uh, he wrote a letter to a king. Um, that's completely forged, obviously. And there are various, there are forged epistles in the New Testament itself and beyond and various things like that. Uh, the two, two of the many guys you'll hear about as somehow attesting to the existence of Jesus are Thallus and uh, Josephus. Uh, I've demonstrated that, in fact, there were originally no references to Jesus in these texts. Uh, and if, you, if you're interested in that, these are the two articles to look for. Uh, find a reference librarian somewhere to see if you can get a hold of them uh, through interlibrary loan if you want to read them. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to go into more detail on that because I'm running out of time. But uh, to give you an analogy for how all this makes sense, um, what really happened, let's look at the Roswell analogy, the idea of the Roswell flying saucer. <laughs> what really happened was that a guy found some sticks and tinfoil in the desert. What was said to have happened, even at that time, was that it was debris from an alien spacecraft. Importantly, what was said to have happened within just 30 years, just 30 years, was that an, an entire flying saucer was recovered, complete with alien bodies that were autopsied by the government. Now, the analogy is this. The tinfoil in the desert would be analogous to the revelations of the archangel named Jesus, this, this Jewish celestial concept of a celestial Jesus. And the flying saucer and alien bodies would be analogous to the historical Jesus of Galilee. Now imagine if we only had the stories written by the Roswell believers from 30 years later and information derived from those and nothing else. Suppose that that was the only information we were allowed to see, which is the case here. We would not know about the tinfoil. All we would have are multiple witnesses and sources reporting a flying saucer recovery and alien body autopsy. Neither of which ever existed. So if it's possible in an age of universal literacy, of newspapers, uh, video, cameras, and everything, if this could happen in our age, think about the ancient world where, where most of the information is destroyed, eyewitnesses only live an average of 50 years, and so on. Uh, you can see how much easier it would be for that kind of thing to happen. Uh, the standard rebuttal is that Christianity is different uh, from those other religions, and Jesus is different from those other dying and rising savior sons of God. But in fact, they're all different from each other. All these sons of God, all these savior gods are different from each other. The differences are not the issue. It's their similarities that identify them as a trend. The differences are part of the syncretism. The things that Jesus is different, the things that make Jesus different are all the Jewish elements that were added on and changed. Uh, so the fact that he's different is not relevant to this argument. Uh, there are elements of Paul and the Gospels that make more sense if there was a real Jesus. Uh, that's not so much the case. In fact, in Paul, those elements, as I showed you some of them, are very few, very vague, and very debatable. And all attempts to extract such data from the Gospels fail in either facts or logic. And that's my book, Proving History, deals with that part of the argument. It pretty much eliminates the Gospels as reliable evidence here. Uh, and then the argument will be made that lots of real historical people are unattested until generations later, or not at all, which is true. However, those people weren't immediately worshipped as demigods about whom our earliest literature says they communicated only by revelations. So you have to realize that Jesus is not just anybody. He, he was immediately deified and immediately people were talking about having conversations with him from heaven. Uh, this, is, this puts him in a different reference class altogether. Uh, and it makes it more likely that he might not have been historical.
And then you can't invent a whole man in just one generation of storytelling. Well, in fact, if you can invent a whole flying saucer, you can invent a whole man. Uh, in fact, Mark invented a three-hour eclipse of the sun that was supposedly witnessed by the entire world. That's a lot harder to get away with than inventing an obscure Galilean preacher. Uh, there are all kinds of wildly public, uh, impossible things that the Gospels claim that are obviously false, that we don't have any evidence of anyone gainsaying. Nevertheless, uh, we know that they're bogus. So if you can invent those things, you can invent a whole man. That's not a difficulty at all. And that idea of the Mark inventing the three-hour eclipse of the sun, I talk about that extensively in my book, Proving History, uh, as an example of how easy it was uh, to make things up and get away with it. <laughs>